Hello, everyone, and welcome to Channel 781 News Waltham Weekly News. I am here with Chris Gamble. Hello. And James Bertellis. Hello, everyone. Um, this week in Waltham, an important person in the community passed away. We're sorry to share the news, Deb Wild, who is the founder of Mothers Out Front Waltham. And uh, at this week's city council meeting, uh, Councillor Bradley MacArthur did uh, a moment of silence for her and referred to her as a second mother. We're hoping to hear more from her uh, about Deb Wild. But um, in the meantime, Chris, could you tell us a little bit more about who Deb Wild was? So, yeah, so unfortunately, a powerhouse of an organizer uh, passed away in Waltham recently. Um, Deb Wild um, on Tuesday passed away from uh, aggressive cancer. It was very sudden um, and she really touched a lot of people's lives. She really had a knack for bringing people together for the common good. She, uh, in her later years, really became... um, very concerned about the climate crisis and helped lead the local chapter of the Mothers Out Front. Um, and most famously um, was uh, succeeded at identifying gas leaks around the community. And that really not only got uh, media attention, city council uh, recognition as well, but just was, it was an incredible effort. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, national politics uh, today. And like last week, I said, this isn't usually something that's brought up um, until it is brought up. And Deb was one of those people that could get the Waltham City Council to talk about national politics and had a way of bringing it to a very local um sense a local frame of mind um and so she will be sorely missed in addition to the news about the wild there's another sad thing that happened um there was a family whose home uh had a fire um but there's an effort in the community to try to help them out so actually james can you tell us more about that so there was a uh, house fire um on the last Sunday of the 12th and causing a family to lose this, all their possessions, clothing, food, and even a pet. And uh, it's current, there's currently a fundraiser that's raised over $36,000 for them. And the uh, restaurants, uh, the Pizzy and uh, Tempo, are going to be donating 10% of their profits on uh, this Thursday to the family. So you should go to them. And the uh, donation, we will post a link as well. Yeah. So also, we'll be talking about community events. Um, I have some more information for you about the school committee budget. We have some information about a young author who got published um, in Waltham, um, an update on the effort to name something after Virginia Monroe. Um, We have a story about Waltham lost in court uh, on an interesting case uh, about zoning. Uh, There was also a um, hearing uh, in the city council this week for Flora Holdings, one of the um, cannabis dispensaries. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So let's talk about uh, upcoming events uh, with help from Mr. Hammer Patriot on Reddit. Um, This weekend is the Waltham River Fest. That looks like an exciting event with lots of activities on both Friday and Saturday. Um, On Sunday the 19th, Waltham Black Future Fund is doing a community cookout at Waltham Community Farm. You do have to sign up in advance for that. So links for all of these events are on the Waltham subreddit if you want to follow up on any of these. There's also a Juneteenth celebration on June 20th um, on the Waltham Common. Um, And the Moody Street Art Walk is happening um, starting Saturday, June 25th. That means that there will be artists showing their work in some of the restaurants and businesses on Moody Street. And the Waltham Children's Business Fair is also happening June 25th. Um, And the uh, Waltham Farmer's Market is going on currently on Saturdays on Moody Street. Um, if you have, and if you know of any others we should be mentioning, you can send them to us or you can submit them with the form that Hammer Patriot set up. That's on Reddit. Uh, you just remind, you reminded me that the um, Waltham Fields Community Farm is doing an ice cream social this Friday. Um, they're partnering with Rankatori's, uh, which is an ice cream place. Uh, and Rankatori's actually makes ice cream from Waltham Fields Community Farm's ingredients. Um, so they're doing a social uh, just a gathering um, this coming Friday. You can uh, Google that if you're interested. I wish I could go. Good to know. Thank you. 
And then Chris, can you tell us more about um, Luke? Uh, yeah, so this is just a nice uh, feel-good story. Um, I'm not going to try to pronounce Luke's last name, um, but uh, if you look up uh, Waltham Patch, um, it's only a headache. Uh, you will find an article, also the Waltham Channel also wrote about it, um, that a young uh, author um, recently published a book in Waltham. Um, he was only 16 years old. Uh, and um, I bought a copy myself uh, immediately as soon as I read it. Um, and I don't know, I just think it's great that a uh, young Walthamite is uh, uh, writing a book. And we're actually in talks with Luke right now uh, to have him on the show to do a quick reading and chat with him. So we're excited to have that come to fruition in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but you should buy a copy uh, and support uh, local artistry. So three weeks ago, we mentioned that Councillor Paz had put forth a resolution to name the gazebo on the Waltham Common after Virginia Monroe, who was a very important organizer um, in Waltham for many years, who passed away recently and a very important mentor um, to some people in town. And uh, we have a little bit of an update for you on that. Uh, James, could you tell us? So the uh, this was covered in the city council meeting, but the a proposed gazebo named after Virginia Monroe was, uh, I guess, changed to a uh, uh, bench on the common named after Virginia Monroe. And we were not in that particular uh, license and franchise meeting. And we had been in the building earlier that day, but not seeing anything on the docket we adopted to leave, which was unfortunate because the, and it, it totally slipped, up, slipped our mind that this was the meeting that the mayor may show up in. So, and there had been a, uh, an off day because of the fifth Monday that month too, which I think threw us off. But unfortunately, that meeting was not recorded, so we don't know the full story about what happened there. Uh, if, anyone, if anyone wants to reach out to us and provide us with that, I'd be more than interested to find out. But, uh, that's the, basically the extent of it. And... Uh, so um, the, what happened, uh, when it comes to fruition, is that uh, instead of the gazebo, which was the originally planned thing, uh, Virginia Monroe is going to have a bench named after her in the common. And that was approved by the full city council. So that's happened. That's done. Um, and so, yeah, it's unfortunate that me and James were in the building and we're looking at licensed branch. I was like, yeah, there's nothing on this docket. There's nothing interesting. Let's just go home. We can watch committee a whole uh, live stream. And so uh, we're, I'm annoyed that we didn't uh, get to do that. I'm going to share my screen really quick for a quick anecdote. Um, but I was like, well, you know, you know, they're not recorded, but counselors will say, oh, we take minutes. So let's go check out the minutes of license of franchise. Uh, the nearest one is April 4th. Um, so if this tracks well, in about two or three months, we will know what happened at that committee. Um, and I swear, once those meetings are released, we're going to go back. We're going to freaking talk about it when we figure out what was talked about in that meeting and how it went from a gazebo to a bench. Um, and another short anecdote is that um, just in this meeting, um, there was a resolution by Kathleen McMiniman uh, to rename the Prospect Hill Bridge after Gold Star Families. And so that's going to committee um, next week. But it's just interesting because it goes back to what I was saying about who decides who is named after what. Um, and so here comes another round of that next week. Thank you. Yes, I'd be very curious to hear that discussion of gazebo to bench, because as far as we know, the gazebo is still not named after anyone, right? So did she get passed up for an unspecified future person? It would be interesting to know that. Um, two other quick stories about things that uh, long-standing court cases that, uh, legal cases, I should say, that um, Waltham has been involved in. Uh, one has to do with, we found out last week that the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts ruled against Waltham in an interesting case involving solar power. Um, so there is a developer who would like to build a solar power plant in Lexington um, in commercial zoning but the access road would go through Waltham and it would be in a residential zone. And a city official told them, no, you can't do that because that would be in a commercial use in a residential zone. And the developer took Waltham to land court and won because according to state law in Massachusetts, basically um, you have to allow 
solar plants. Cities and towns can only restrict solar plants if it's necessary for the health, safety, or well-being of the town. They're pretty much exempt from zoning. Um, so Waltham lost and then took it to the Supreme Judicial Court. And so apparently Waltham has a, an ordinance that says you can build power plants in industrial areas. It doesn't specify solar, but it includes solar. Um, and industrial areas only take up about one to 2% of Waltham. So the city's argument was that it was reasonable to deny them uh, to build this road in a residential zone because they already have zoning for solar. So they're not preventing zoning. They're, they're not preventing solar. They're just having it in an appropriate place. Um, so the justices asked some questions. I watched part of the hearing. The justices asked some questions that kind of brought out that there are other court cases that have determined how we decide whether it is something's a reasonable restriction on solar. And none of them involve it, you know, we you can say to do it here because you let them do it somewhere else. So that wasn't really the standard and Waltham's employer couldn't really give a case where it set that standard. Um, so the court ruled against Waltham saying that yes, they can go ahead. Uh, they have we have to allow um, this developer to go ahead and build this road. And not only that, but they said it's specifically not reasonable uh, for Waltham to only allow solar in one to two percent of the land in the city. So if another developer comes in and wants to do solar, we, we can't enforce that restriction on them. So uh, I thought that was interesting story um, having to do with zoning. And then another interesting story, uh, this week in the city council, the mayor asked the council to approve um, a, I believe it was $80,000 um, to uh, pay to Sally Calora to um, settle a, a case that was in mediation. Sally Calora, for those who don't know, is a former city councilor. She's also a host of a long running show on WCAC. And she was until recently the owner of the Tea Leaf, which is the tea shop on Moody Street. She recently sold it to um, Robin Capello, who's another person who's very involved in the community, especially in the arts. So it'll be interesting to see what she does with it. But way back in 2006, uh, Sally Wicalora was working for another business on Moody Street. I don't know much about the business, but it was run by a Mr. Snyder. And he fired her because he said that she was using his time to work on her business and her cable show. So when he fired her, she went to the building inspector and reported him for a bunch of violations doing thing, business in that building that wasn't allowed in the zoning. I don't know the details. So the um, city came after um, the business owner and um, levied some fines and he sued the city um, and named Sally Calora and two other city councilors in the suit um, on civil rights grounds that the council had conspired to unfairly target him. And actually, I don't know what ended up happening with that case because I couldn't find an article about it. So I don't know if he won or not. But uh, Sally Calora chose to use her own, hire her own lawyer while the other two counselors um, had the city lawyer defend them. So at some point, um, she asked for a reimbursement from the city and the city said, no, I'm not sure on what grounds exactly, if it was because she hired her own lawyer or because it was too much or what. But they went to mediation and this is the number they came up with. So that's now owed to Sally. I think mostly this is interesting because this is uh, an incident that happened in 2006 and some of our viewers weren't even born in 2006 and this is now sent to the finance committee so they will most likely approve it but it's just kind of funny to see the time scale at which controversies can happen in Waltham. Also uh, Sally's a terrible person um, and she has a long history of uh, racism and just all around is not a great person uh, and I don't like her. And just to be clear, this is, she's, this is, this is for a court case that was over her abusing her position as a city counselor. And this is paying her back for using her own lawyer for defending herself. And it's like $80,000. Yeah, and actually, uh, she she asked for more than that, and we should say allegedly abusing her power because I don't know what the court actually found about that. But um, yes, it it's a it's an interesting case um, where uh, 
you know, it seems like some people who are very proud of their community and involved in their community have no problem suing their community. So I thought it was interesting in that way too. In this week's city council meeting, there was a public hearing for Flora Holdings, which is one of the businesses um, applying for a special permit to open a cannabis dispensary in the Bear Hill area. Um, like the other hearings, this is a repeat. They did a hearing when they first applied, and now they're doing an additional hearing um, because there are new city councilors. So we didn't get a lot of new information from it. Um, they are, this is a business owned by two local couples. This would be their first business. They'd like to also open a cultivation business, but they haven't found a site for it yet. So right now they're applying for an adult use only license. They're not applying for medical, which some of the others are because they would need a cultivation in order to do that. Um, so not much interesting new in the hearing. I did notice one thing, which was um, Councillor Lafasi asked, and he's actually asked something similar to this in all the, the, the hearings that I've seen. He asked, uh, when did they start the process? And he asked, are you paying rent on the property? Or he asked something about, you know, are you basically, are you losing money as you're waiting to get your license? And the answer for most of them is yes. And um, so it seemed like he was trying to push things forward. Like he was trying to draw attention to the fact that this has already taken too long, which was interesting because in the past, I thought he was was kind of against moving it forward because he seemed to be bringing up often the fact that there um, is residential in the area and kind of reminding that. Um, but it is his ward, Bear Hill area is in ward one. So if he is actually in favor of moving these things forward, that's um, pretty significant. Another not important, but kind of fun thing that happened during uh, at the beginning of this hearing was first, um, the Councillor Darcy had made a motion to allow them to do this hearing. So the, count, the council had to vote on that before the hearing could start. So they did that and that led to a kind of interesting uh, interaction between Clerk Vizard and President McMenamin, which we'll show you the clip. Thank you very much. So by your action, you have uh, rescheduled at a, a new time a public hearing for floral holdings llc and the clerk will and the clerk's office will determine when that time will take place thank you it's been determined it has been determined so it will be when is it right now so therefore <laughs> <laughs> therefore the clerk will read the public hearing on the special permit of floral holdings Special Permit Floor Holdings, LLC, uh, Caitlin Smith and Erica Zimmerman, well. managers. So I think this proves that Councillor McMenamin does have a sense of humor because you can definitely see a smile there. It's not easy to see, uh, but I definitely think there was a smile there. And this may be the first proof I've seen that she had, does have a sense of humor. Chris, did you have any comment on that? I think it was just hilarious. Often this isn't... Uh this isn't the funniest year in the city council. There have been past councilors that bring us some humor in. There's very few people that bring humor in. So it's nice that we get to, we get a laugh every now and again. Well, so let's talk a little bit more about uh, the school budget. So uh, last week I talked about this and we told you that um, the uh, superintendent had proposed a budget to the school committee of about $101 million. And the mayor asked him to cut that um, down to about $98 million. And that new number is what the school committee voted on and that's what's going to the city council. And the Waltham Educators Association put out a petition asking people to oppose that um, cut and um, ask the city council to uh, to approve the superintendent's budget. And Chris had pointed out that when we're saying the superintendent's budget, it's not really about him, that we're asking people to not to support him, but to support the teachers and the union. And Chris said something like, you know, this is the superintendent's budget, this is the teacher's budget. And one of our audience members pointed out that's not technically correct. The union had no part in making this budget. At least some of the school staff and educators feel that in fact, the superintendent's proposed budget of $101 million was not enough. It was not enough for them to do uh, what they need to do as a school and had a number of concerns about it. So there were already concerns about that budget and um, then there was this additional cut. So I tried to get a little bit more background on this. I watched some, but not all of the meetings and I talked to some people who've been following this closely. Um, so back in April, 
21st, um, the superintendent put forth that budget. And he, that was after lots and lots of conversation. And he made it pretty clear that he saw his job was to come up with a budget that the school committee was comfortable with. So at least in this point of the process, he wasn't talking about this is what we need. He put forth this budget and he said, I'd like you to pass this. And if you don't pass this, I want you to tell me exactly what I need to change. So it was at that point in the process, it was more about the school committee's expectations and him saying what was needed. Um, so in that meeting, um, before they voted, um, Mr. Tarallo asked to add a fifty thousand dollars to the budget for a night school program, and he had a he was very concerned because um, graduation rates are very low, especially among the population of uh, students who are learning English at the same time as they're learning anything else, and that's a very big population and growing population in Waltham. And that includes, I didn't know this till recently, that includes kids who before they were in Waltham, they were in detention camps. So they are dealing with trauma um, and upheaval in their lives on top of learning a language and learning the customs of a new country. So when you have a lot of kids like that in a class, that there's a lot of little emergencies and problems where the teacher has to stop and address that. And so you really need another person in the room to help address those problems so the teacher can teach. And the ESL program doesn't have that to the extent that they should. That's one of the concerns about the budget. So Mr. Tarallo put forth um, a he asked to add $50,000 to the budget for a night school program, and he had a budget worked out where he thought that that could, would provide 30 kids with the opportunity they needed to possibly graduate who wouldn't graduate otherwise. And he was voted down on that by the committee. And the main um, objection was we've tried lots of things to help that population that didn't work. So why do you think this one's going to work? Um, we'd need more information to, to tell us that this is going to be successful before we're willing to put forward that amount of money. And uh, Mr. Frasica actually made a comment saying, well, if we add that, what do we cut? So he's talking about a hundred million dollar budget and he's saying we can't increase the total by 50,000 unless we cut it somewhere else. So that's, um, so anyways, that was one, just one issue, but I'd like to show you the clip actually of how Mr. Torello responded to that because I think it, it says a lot about um, how the committee thinks about their responsibility in this. So I've worked in education now for 15 years, 10 of which was in alternative programming. The last five has been in administration. In communities that demographically are close to Walthams and communities that have put much more emphasis on credit recovery and dropout rates. Seeing that right now our graduation has rate has dropped 5% over the last year, that's huge. Those are students who are not being able to meet their potential because they haven't had opportunities that they may need. It's our job to make sure the students of Waltham who have only one time through their education to be able to succeed. Just to give a little background on the school budget, you can see here, this is from the city website where you can get these, there's a tool you can use to make these kind of graphs. It's actually pretty cool. This is the current year's budget. You can see for education was budgeted at a little over $94 million. That's the biggest chunk of our city budget followed by health insurance and um, public safety. This is also from city website. It shows how the blue line is education and it shows how that's gone up over the past seven or eight years relative to other departments. So you see it has gone up um, quite a bit, um, although it's flatlined recently. Uh, you can also, this is another one looking at it as a percentage of the total budget. So this blue section, you see as when you look at it as a percentage of our total budget, it actually hasn't increased very much. This is an infographic from Waltham Educators Association um, that shows the increase in school budget relative to the increase in our revenue. So revenue is going up faster than school budget is going up. So what that means is the reason the mayor's asking for these cuts is not because we can't afford this. There is the money there. And here's another um, 
graphic also from Waltham Educators Association that shows that the discretionary money Waltham has that could potentially be put towards education. This budget is actually quite a bit higher than some of our neighboring communities. Um, and, and this at this city council meeting, didn't um, Kathleen invite the superintendent to the next finance uh, committee meeting to chat? Did I, am I remembering that correctly? I'm not sure if she invited the superintendent. I, what she saw, and that's a good question. She asked that the school department send to the finance committee a spreadsheet of everybody's compensation. Oh. And the reason she gave for that was the, she said the other departments, when they send their budget to the city council, the format allows them to see how each person's compensation affects that. But the format the school committee uses doesn't allow that. So you need, she was telling the councilors, you're going to need this second spreadsheet in order to understand what you're looking at. Now, that's interesting because the Educators Association has, is basically asking people to tell the council not to support this cut budget, to support the original budget. And that's a big ask because it's rare for the city council. I don't know how rare it is. Chris, you might be able to say more than that. But it's very rare for the city council to want to give a department more than they've officially asked for. Um, the other part of it is they might not want to set the precedent that they are this involved in the school budget because then people might be coming to them with other problems about the school. And in fact, there was a candidate event last um, fall just before the election where um, Councillor McMiniman made comments. I'm not sure the question she was responding to, but something about the schools. And she basically said, the city council has nothing to do with the schools. They send us a number and we say yes or no. So it was interesting when she asked for these additional compensation numbers for the school. I don't know if that's something she always does or if that's something she did because she's expecting uh, this to be an issue yeah. um, for the city council. I would say I would say it's because she perceives this being as, as being contentious. Um, and she's absolutely correct. The city council has almost nothing to do with the school committee budget. Um, and even less so than what you had suggested because they can't add any money. They can't add money to the budget. They can only cut uh, what the mayor puts forward. Um, so there's very, very little that the Waltham city council can do um, in this, but I mean, it's. It, I think it's gonna be contentious. Um, I'm hoping that the union and the city come to an agreement that is beneficial to the students very quickly and that it just does not get ugly, but I, I foresee it getting ugly. And I hope that we can do our part in shining a spotlight on that very soon. Thank you, yes. And to, to get, uh, actually to give a little bit more background on the process and where these cuts came from, I don't really know. I never found anything where the mayor clearly said why this cut has to happen, why this specific cut has to happen. What happened was the when the um, superintendent on April 21st asked them to approve the budget, uh, Mr. Torello tried to add to it, that didn't work. They took a vote and it was three to three. And the mayor, has the um, seventh vote, but she said she chose not to vote because she also has this role of recommending things to the council. So it failed. And then the plan was that the mayor to the superintendent, we're gonna work with the city auditor to come up with a good number that made sense in the context of the city budget which was how she put it. And then that's the number she recommended to the council. And my understanding is that's also the number that the school committee voted to approve to send to the council. Um, so this, it seems like these cuts are being based on, uh, you know, the, the, the superintendent is trying to meet the expectations of the school committee, but it seems like the school committee is also trying to meet the expectations of the mayor and the city council. So it seems to be more based on expectations um, than on need. But the concerns that I understand um, are, there are about both versions of the budget is that it underfunded the second language program, like I explained, and also that there are some teachers who are leaving and the budget is calling for for hiring of long-term substitutes. Um, so that seems like a good idea. If you're having staffing issues, you want people who are always on hand to substitute. But the problem is those substitutes make a lot less than a regular teacher, and they may not have the educational background that's usually required to teach the class they're teaching. So there's concern that this could become a trend of hiring people who cost less but are less qualified. Um, here is what uh, Ms. Um, Shafley had to say um, about her response to 
the superintendent's initial budget recommendation. She is uh, the administrative assistant for the guidance department at the school, and um, she is also the mom of uh, a senior who graduated last year. She's someone who comes to almost all the school committee meetings and follows it very closely, and she made comments about this. I'm dismayed and upset to hear that we are losing two great teachers this year, especially when we haven't been able to find substitutes this year and students end up in the lecture hall, a lunch from, at times for many students up to three hours a day, or in many instances just leaving the building. When we have 34 students sitting in this very lecture hall in a math class every single day who are newcomer ELL students who don't always have a parent who is able to advocate for them, I wonder how much are these students learning or how rewarding is it for that teacher? We allow, that we allow this to happen is disgraceful. When electives are over capacity and are filled and students are left with no choices of any class they may be interested in. How can we not find the funds to keep great staff when I say numerous new administration positions in the budget, unwillingness to remove any of those, those positions, and people with individual contracts getting in some instances over a 7% increase in pay, yet I hear rumblings in the community that we are offering educators less than 1% when just today I saw a headline that said a teacher crisis. <laughs> Educators leaving their profession in record numbers. We need staff who work directly with students in the trenches every single day. We need class sizes at a manageable level for students and for teachers. We need positions like the two attendance officers who walk around the school to stop kids from piling out the door every single day to head to Duncan's to get themselves a coffee. Stop fights and not only keep kids safe, but ensure kids actually feel safe. A lot of people haven't felt safe here in a long time. We need testing coordinators so that students who are entitled to legal accommodations actually receive them. A scheduler knows, who knows the ins and outs of the system, bilingual school adjustment counselors who can communicate with the close to 300 new students we have received this year, many who English is not their first language. Paris who support the teachers when they need it, training on the system and new schedule, more guidance counselors, a free summer credit recovery school program instead of asking families many who have limited income to pay $200 for a summer school class they can't afford at a time when it's almost impossible for them to be here. That we force families who are poor to tell us they are poor and need assistance when we already know this is troubling. We need an actual alternative program for students. I watched the school committee a few weeks ago when Mr. Torello proposed putting money into the budget to fund a couple of teachers for this and he got no support here. Instead, it was decided that more talk was needed. It is necessary for me to remind you that you have been talking about this for more than five years. And while we sit here and continue to talk, kids are dropping out of high school and students who aren't safe to be at the high school, or this isn't the right place for them, continue to be here. There are numerous other school districts who have valuable programs in place that can be replicated almost immediately. When the superintendent interviewed here, I clearly remember when he was discussing how he would work through the budget process. He said part of that process was ensuring that parents, students, and staff were part of that process. And I'm disappointed to say that hasn't been the case because I don't see their voices in the budget, nor were any of them at the table when it was developed. Instead, we survey everyone over and over again, then do nothing with those results to improve the experiences of students and families and staff. Right here at the school committee, back in the fall, students told you exactly what they wanted and their voices went unheard. So we will continue to follow that. It seems like there's a certain urgency if the committee wants to, um, if the community wants the city council to ask the school committee to reconsider this budget. One option is instead of saying no, they could send it back to the school committee and say, we want you to reconsider this and that process should involve a public hearing because then more teachers and parents would get to weigh in on this and that would at least address the concern um, that teachers needs were not being um, heard. Speaking of Councillor Bradley MacArthur, she has put forward two resolutions that are very interesting. One was the Waltham Pride resolution. The other had to do with ride sharing. And so we have some updates on that. Uh, Chris, do you, was that supposed to go to Chris or James? Yeah, Chris? I can do that. Um, okay, Chris, you tell us about that. So this is kind of interesting. You know, I talked uh, two weeks ago about how national politics was gonna come into play. Um, 
in uh, this the city council and the debrief. And um, last week, I didn't really actually, you know, continue that conversation. I did provide updates, but I didn't really continue that conversation. The things that we talked about that would come with national politics, they had they came to a head today, um, coming to an approval, uh, the pride uh, resolution, as well as the Uber question. Um, and so at the very end of the meeting, um, uh, last week, Colleen Bradley MacArthur, our friend, uh, mentioned for the Uber question that she needed more time to work on this, which was like an ominous way to end it. And I didn't really understand it. Maybe it's like someone had talked to her and I still don't even know, we should ask her. Um, uh, what that meant. Um, and I really didn't think it was going to come up again this meeting that just passed. And so it did. But at the very end of the meeting, uh, Colleen brought it off the table and said that uh, a couple of people wanted to talk on it. And John McLaughlin, uh, the Ward 4 City Councilor, actually did a great job of talking about how this is outside money, about how the, this is just a way to, you know, hurt workers. Um, and I thought it was a really uh, nice speech. And then uh, they ended up approving it, uh, despite uh, some counselors voting no. Um, Anthony LaFauci, Kathy Ann Harris, Carlos Vidal, and Randy LeBlanc all voted no on the declaration that they would be against this. Um, uh, and so you know, they're really putting their neck out. And what's hilarious is that about eight hours ago, the Massachusetts uh court threw out the question, um, based on I, I, after a quick Google search, um. It was the wording was too obscure legally to even go on a ballot, and so that will not appear in uh, on your ballot in November. That just won't be there. So it's a huge win for the campaign against it, and it's a huge win for the counselors that not only uh, said yes to this, but it's a huge loss to the counselors that said no. And then literally one day later, they took an L, and uh, now now they look bad. Do you think they look bad because now the, the 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 state supreme court has said that it was um, yeah they said it was a bad law. they said it was bad and uh, four counselors disagreed with that judge but thank you James did you have anything to add on that I, just the, the list of counselors opposing it but like, you know, Fauci, Harris, Vidal, and LeBlanc was kind of stood out to them. I was not expecting that to be a hill they wanted to die on, especially like, yeah, because the extent of what this was was sending a letter to the state house basically saying that the, the wall then didn't want this. So, yeah. And also that they explicitly called for a roll call vote. I believe it was Harris who called for the roll call vote. Yeah, yeah. Harris, who voted no, called for the roll call vote. So she wanted to be on the record saying, I do not agree with this thing that a Massachusetts judge in one day is going to throw out. <laughs> okay, and then on the pride resolution, that was officially approved this week. That yeah. wasn't a surprise. No chatter, of the no whole. chatter there. No chatter about it. There was there was some, but not a lot of chatter uh, when it was introduced in Committee of the Whole. Um, it appeared that when they voted on it in Committee of the Whole, it was unanimous, but it wasn't a roll call. So some people might not have voted. So when we talked to Councillor Bradley MacArthur, I would love to ask her about um, if she got any feedback from her fellow counselors on that resolution. And, and oh yes. And uh, and just a note, I, I just want to note that I was correct in saying the for the Uber question, the people that voted no had no comment. Uh, I talked about how you know national politics coming into play. It's not it's not usual, and most counselors don't really want their national politics being broadcasted uh, for voting purposes. And so the people, four people that voted no had no comment on why they're voting no. And so I would like to proclaim that I was right. Um, I would also like to proclaim that I said that they might have something to say. And so I was playing both sides. And so I came out on top, whichever way it happened. <laughs> Well, on that note, that is all the <laughs> topics we have to discuss for tonight. Um, and we will be back next week. Um, we The city council is happening on, uh, city council committee meetings are happening on Tuesday next week. because And, uh, and I will actually not be able to be here. So this will be the first debrief that I missed. So I hope you guys are okay uh, without me. 
Well, in that case, James and I and, and whatever um, substitute <laughs> we can find will be back um, next week. Um, we'll be posting it a day later than usual. And we'll see you then. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone.